We've arrived at the third part of our Introduction to Primat Chroma Key tutorial. In this segment, we're going to work on a fairly complex image. This photograph is of a model with very wispy, delicate hair who's holding an object that has a definite semi-transparency. It's a glass bottle through which you can see the blue background. The more important thing to notice about this photograph is that the blue background is problematic. The blue is actually forming a radial pattern or a gradient going from a very light blue to a fairly dark blue around the edges of the photograph. This very light blue area is caused by a light or a hot spot. Hot spots and the gradient background that they cause are challenging for chroma key work because chroma key really needs to look at as small a tonal range as possible. If we look at the other two photographs that we've used in these introductory tutorials, you'll notice that the blue background of the incense and smoke photograph is all within the same tonal range. Similarly, the green background behind our model is very flat. In fact, there is very little variation in the green behind her. Going back to the photograph that we're going to work on in this tutorial, you can starkly see the hot spot and the gradient of tonal values that it's causing. There are a few approaches to a problematic photograph depending upon what the problem is. The thing to know about Primat, or really any other digital tool that you're using in your photographic workflow, is that there really is no tool that provides a one-stop solution for every image that you're going to encounter. One of the nice things about working in Primat is that you're inside of Photoshop and you have all of Photoshop's tools at your disposal. Most of the time, Primat will take you 100% of the way you need to go. It will fully and beautifully extract your image. Other times, it will get you 95% or maybe 85% of the way. And it's easier in those cases to let Primat do most of the work, do what it does best, that is extract the very difficult areas like the semi-transparency of this bottle and the flyaway hair of the model, and let Photoshop's simple tools correct the areas that Primat couldn't access. So, enough talking, let's extract this image. What I'm first going to do is use Photoshop's selection tool to cut out the area of this image that I don't need. That is, I'm going to make a very, very simple pre-mask and delete out the darkest, furthest tones from my image. Narrowing the range that Primat needs to look at will make our masking process go much more smoothly. And as you can see, I've been very careful to select outside of the model and in particular away from the model's flyaway hair which we're going to work to preserve. Oftentimes this process of creating a pre-mask is called making a garbage mask or a garbage mat that is getting rid of the unimportant imagery or garbage around the edges of your photograph. Now that we've created our garbage mat we're going to divide our image into two sections. I will select out the area of this photograph that contains the hot spot and I'm going to section that off onto a new layer. To do this I'm going to float this selection. The keyboard command for that is Apple J on the Mac, Control J on Windows. Or I can go up to my layer menu, go to the new submenu, and select layer via copy or Apple J. And what this command does is it creates a new layer with the selection. 
I still have that imagery on my original layer, but I have a duplicate of it on a second layer. And I'm going to call that layer right. Now let's apply Primat to this part of our photograph. In Primat, the plugin automatically recognizes the last mask that we created. So as per usual, I'm going to hit my reset key. Even though we're working with only a portion of our photograph, I'm still going to do the same three-step, three-tool masking process that I've been doing. With the Select button, I'm going to define the color to eliminate. With the Clean BG or Clean Background button in Mask View, I'm going to further define the transparency of our background. And with the Clean Foreground tool or Clean FG tool, I'm going to clean up any issues that I see in the area that I want to leave opaque. I don't really see any issues. It looks like the girl's head and figure have been masked correctly, but just to check, I'm going to go to my front button, and I'm going to look to see that the areas in our mask view that are black, that is transparent, are in fact areas that I want to have transparent, and they are. Let me zoom in here a little bit and pan over. And now let's look again in mask view and then in our composite view and see what we've retained. We're looking at our image against the bottom most layer of our Photoshop file, but I'm going to choose to composite it against a solid color for a better preview. It looks like the model's hair is well defined, but certainly it has too much blue spill on it. We can easily get rid of that. I'm going to try the Spill Minus tool first. Which doesn't seem to be the right way to approach it. So let's try our Spill Sponge tool, which has a wider tonal range that it looks at. And if I hit my undo and my redo button, you'll see that the spill sponge was a good solution for retaining the detail of the bottle and the model's hair, but getting rid of any blue spill that occurred. And one last item, I'm going to go to my Restore Detail tool and just poke around the woman's hair to see if I can bring back a little bit more of the detail of the strands. I think that we have retained what we're going to retain, so let's zoom back to our full view, preview the model against the bottommost layer again. That looks really good to me, so off screen I'm going to hit my apply button. Back in Photoshop, we have an excellent mask on one half of our image. If I zoom in and move this image around so you can see, uh, notice that we have a beautiful transparency value to our bottle, and we've maintained quite a bit of the model's flyaway hair. Let's zoom back out and examine the rest of this image. To select the rest of the image that needs to be masked out, I'm going to use my Photoshop Marquee tool to drag a selection around the area that has already been masked. And then with my original layer selected, I'm just going to delete out that part of the image. When I turn on the layer named right, you'll see that it seamlessly creates one layer. We'll turn off the view of the right layer, rename our original layer 
left. And now let's apply Primat to that second layer. Back in Primat, Primat recognizes the previous mask that we created. In this case, it's going to prove itself useful. Instead of selecting the reset key, I'm just going to go to my mask view and check out the mask that's been created. If we zoom in a bit, you'll see that because we're treating another area of the same image, Primat's mask settings are virtually seamless. All I really need to do is select my clean foreground tool to clean up or rather make opaque the woman's face. Primat has accurately described the background, the black area that forms the transparency and it's done a terrific job of recognizing the model's flyaway hair. If I go to my comp view to look at the composite and I toggle that with my front view, you'll see that the majority of her hair has been retained. Let's go to our composite view again and preview that against a single color background. I had anticipated that perhaps her eye would give us a little bit of a problem because it's blue and therefore a tonal range that's similar to the color that Primat has been extracting, but it looks like Primat was intelligent enough to detect this eye as a segregate from the color that's being extracted. There is no color spill issue in this section of our image and therefore no correction that needs to be done beyond what we've already accomplished. So off screen for the last time I will apply Primat. Having returned to Photoshop we can see that the model has been accurately masked. I will zoom in and I'm going to turn on the right layer so that we can look at the composite as a whole. If I hide our backdrop layer to look at this image against transparency, the one issue that I see is a slight spray of pixels that's been left behind during the masking process. As I mentioned before, the aspect of working on a Primat image within Photoshop gives us a very simple solution. All I really need to do is go to my eraser tool, make sure I have a large brush set, make sure that that brush is soft as well. Notice the hardness is down to zero and we have about a hundred pixel wide brush. I'll work with 100% opacity and making sure I'm on the correct layer, I'm just going to very softly and quickly remove the extra pixels that are hanging out. As I get closer to the image, perhaps I will lower the opacity of the eraser tool. and using the eraser tool in Photoshop is a very tidy solution to a sophisticated process. To reiterate what I said previously, oftentimes Primat will get you the majority of the way to where you need to be. That is, it will work on the areas that would be virtually impossible for you to extract otherwise and then you can use Photoshop's simple tools to trim up any little problem areas. I will zoom out of this image and I'm going to link these two images together, merge linked, and now we have our masked image against our background. 
Well, I want to thank you for making it to the end of this rather lengthy introductory tutorial. It certainly had imagery that would be very difficult to hand mask, and Primate did a very accurate and quick job in extracting the green from behind the semi-transparency of this glass and the wispy flyaway hair of our model. But in order to compensate for the poor lighting conditions that made up this photograph, we wound up making a garbage mat to mask out or pre-mask areas that had too wide a tonal range for Primate to accurately work with. And then we divided this image in two, did a quick extraction on each of the halves of this image, and used Photoshop's eraser tool to quickly do some manual cleanup.